Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Creative Conversations. Thanks for being with me. Um, before we begin tonight, I'd just like to acknowledge that here in Seattle, we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people, both past and present. We honor with gratitude both the land we are on and the Duwamish tribe. Uh, tonight, I'm excited to have a conversation with Manny Kowaling. Uh, Manny is the executive director for Inspire Washington, which is a merger of Cultural Access Washington and the Washington State Arts Alliance. We're going to be talking about arts advocacy tonight. Um, but prior to this position, Manny spent 10 years as the executive director for Youth Theater Northwest, providing children on Mercer Island and throughout King County with creative education and live theater experiences. Manny has a long, uh, long established career as a theater maker. Uh, he's a Seattle native and he's been working professionally as an artist and cultural leader for 30 years. Um, Manny was part of the founding of the Seattle's Fringe Theater Festival, the first in the US, which um, also grew to be one of the largest in the country. He also served as the Associate Artistic Director for the Northwest Asian American Theater and uh, crossing mediums and disciplines, he was the exhi exhibit developer and manager for the Wing Luke Asian Museum. From 2003 to 2008, Manny served on the staff of the Langston Hughes Cult, uh, Performing Arts Center, and he initiated uh, artistic programming, and then he was also the managing director there overseeing all administrative and programmatic activities. He's held many many illustrious positions um, throughout the arts and cultural sector over the years um, and is a, a major arts leader uh, in our state. Please give a warm Zoom welcome to Manny Kualing. Hello, I felt like after that intro, I need to enter with a cane. <laughs> <laughs> you're, much, you're much younger than you, than you, <laughs> than your resume suggests, Manny. <laughs> Um, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, oh, pleasure. I, I definitely want to get into talking about arts advocacy, Inspire Washington with you tonight. Um, but I want to start with the fact that you're a, a Seattle native. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, is, is actually kind of rare in our city, it seems like sometimes, especially when it comes to the art, arts and culture sector. But um, uh, what are some... What are some early experiences, arts experiences that really influenced you to go into the arts? Gosh, <clears throat> you know, I grew up on uh, Capitol Hill. My parents still live over there. <clears throat> and um, what was really wonderful about growing up, uh, my dad had a love of museums and, uh, and he's kind of like a walking um, uh, historian. He loves to tell stories about, you know, when I was a kid, what used to be there. Um, uh, but growing up on Capitol Hill, back in those times, uh, you know, uh, the Seattle Art Museum was our neighborhood museum. The, it, it, before it was downtown, it was only at Volunteer Park. Um, so, uh, you know, and Mohai Museum of History and Industry was right just right down the hill. So growing up, it, art was in the neighborhood, you know, um, and creativity was in the neighborhood. Um, my first performance, uh, I was a student at uh, St. Joseph uh, School on Capitol Hill. And uh, the local high school just down the street, Holy Names Academy, was doing a production of The Wizard of Oz. Why is that every, you know, so many people's first play or some for some kids, their only play. And they needed munchkins. And uh, so all the third graders uh, played uh, munchkins. And uh, uh, and that was my first show ever. Um, you know, really, uh, you know, growing up in Seattle, I, I, I really had the opportunity to be exposed to uh, you know, theater and and art and um, and I had hardworking parents and they couldn't always afford it, but there were a lot of great organizations that that still provided opportunities for kids to see things. I remember I saw my first Seattle Children's Theater play uh, back when they were located on the grounds of Woodland Park Zoo at the old Poncho Playhouse or whatever it used to yeah, be. I remember called. that. I saw shows there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it is really rare to be a Seattle native. So some of my really kind of like stories, like people, uh, people always say, God, is that real? I used to deliver uh, this, the, this Capitol Times on Capitol Hill, you know, um, I was a Seattle Times paper boy for, for a number of years. So um, I certainly have seen this town grow uh, through so many different phases into uh, the world-class city that we are today. 
Yeah. And, and what, when you started getting involved in theater professionally, what was the, what was the theater mm-hmm. ecosystem like then uh, when you were working for the Fringe Festival and then N- yeah. uh, NWAT and what was that like? Well, uh, you know, I did my first, uh, the first show that I did outside of like high school, right after I graduated from high school, uh, the Northwest Asian American Theater, which used to be located in the theater off Jackson, uh, they were they were doing a second run of uh, of a musical that was really popular called Miss Minidoka 1943, well, which was a, a musical about um, a beauty contest. Uh, that was ironically being held within a Japanese American internment camp in Minidoka. And uh, Kathy She was in that performance as well. And uh, they needed to replace one of the actors who had moved to California. And uh, so there I was, a teenager. I was 17 years old. I auditioned for the play. Um, it was kind of in that phase you, 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 a theater kid goes through where they're ending high school and you're thinking like, well, what am I re- going to do next, right? And uh, my parents were not encouraging me to pursue theater, but uh, but I got cast in the show. And then all of a sudden I was, you know, the youngest cast member, a teenager working with these adult actors. And, uh, um, and, and that, I really consider that to be a pivotal experience in a lot of different ways. One, to really see just how professional theater worked and that people did this for a living or, or they even carved a space out for it, balanced with another job. And, um, and also seeing the power of story and performance to really educate and inspire and, and, and lift up and spotlight a story that many people don't understand. The number of Japanese American internees who came to the show and wanted to talk to us about what it was like to be in an internment camp, right? Um, that really spoke to me on a very different level. It was no longer our high school production of Camelot. <laughs> you know, it was, it was theater on a very different level. Um, and then uh, at that time too, so now we're kind of like in the early nineties and it, it's kind of fun to talk about the early days of the fringe because uh, I was recently talking to somebody. And in fact, because I was talking to them, I had to go through all of my old archives and I found this League of Fringe Theater brochure um, with all the theaters that were members of Loft at the time. You know, Seattle was just growing, it, you know? It, so imagine in the early nineties, Capitol Hill, really affordable to, to live in, right? Uh, also, affordable spaces meant that theaters were popping up in restaurants and in underutilized church halls and all over the place, right? Um, and a lot of people were moving here and just wanted to be creative. And, and the existing theater scene at the time just wasn't large enough to accommodate all those artists, right? Uh, so theaters were just springing up left and right. Um, back in the, I mean, gosh, in those times, there, there were dozens and dozens of, of theaters on Capitol Hill in such, bizarre spaces. I I had to remember that there was one theater space that actually was a restaurant. Uh, It was, um, oh God, it was a breakfast restaurant that's, uh, that's on, that was on Broadway. And they used to do a show every Friday called Cabaret Eggs. (laughs) I mean, this is just how creative people would take any space and, and, and fill it with story uh, and theater and, and all of that beautiful theater magic. Uh, And, and an audience that was really open and willing to see anything experimental, right? Um, uh, so I miss those times. I mean, it's it, it seen, uh, I, there's still of course a tremendous amount of creativity, but the, the affordability of spaces for, for theater to happen in and, and for artists to live here has just really, I think just dramatically transformed Capitol Hill. Uh, and also the days back when uh, Belltown was in kind of a theater hub. Uh, I mean, gosh, I remember at one time we used to say there were 30 arts organizations, over 30 arts organizations in South Lake Union. Because it was so... Uh, I remember, I remember that. It was so so different, such a different landscape. I go down there now and I don't recognize it. Now we're both sounding like old guys, but... Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up my cane. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drink my Metamucil, yeah. <laughs> but it's true. There, I think the, 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 the city, the spirit of the city and the affordability of it and its attraction for artists made it possible for that kind of ecosystem to thrive yes. at a certain level. I mean, obviously funding was hard then too in, in some ways, but because the cost of living was lower, it was for some artists it was easy it was it was easier to to still make work and you could find cheap space and throw something together. And I remember, you know, I remember standing in line for the Fringe Festival all night to get a spot, you know, and, and all of that. And there was 
there was such a sense of community and just all those people there in Belltown at three o'clock in the morning, hoping to get a spot in the French festival. There was a kind of electricity about all of that. Oh yeah. And it's amazing when, so one thing that I had to rediscover in Heinz when I was looking at through all this stuff I was sharing with a student who was studying the fringe theater movement. Um, it's amazing to me how much happened in a short span of time. Like the League of Fringe Theaters incorporated as an organization, because I just went through all this stuff in October of 1990. And then the first Fringe Festival was that January or February. Like there was just so, I mean, there was just, there was just an abundance of, of energy and excitement and creative enthusiasm that we were just kind of making things happen by the skin of our pants. It was yeah. a little crazy. It's really humbling to look at the first brochure of the, of the fringe, the first festival, because there's a ton of typos in there. <laughs> you know, I'm sure we were rushing to the printer to get it done. Uh, but gosh, you know, give creative people an impossible task and we're, we're going to make magic happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And what was it like when you started moving into, into institutions and leadership roles? Like, you know, it's like, it's one thing as, as artists when we're just, in, and especially in our 20s, when we're creating and just trying to throw stuff together. But then you, then you move into leadership roles for uh, some really um, groundbreaking POC-led organizations in the yeah. city. What was that like at that time in terms of both making the art and fundraising and all of that. What was that like? Gosh, there's so many different ways to answer it. I mean, uh, uh, you know, on a really personal level, just, a, you know, a, as a, a theater art, artist, you know, scraping to get by. Uh, thank you, Wing Luke, for providing me with health insurance for the very first time. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, so there was kind of like a stability to it. That was really what I needed, right? Yeah. Um, and then also really understanding the complex nature of how, uh, organizations survive, right? That there are all of these, um, there's these rings of support, you know, and there's a real professionalism that you have to really strive for to, or, or um, um, in telling your story. I mean, you've got, you've got a lot of people invested in the work now, right? right. And you're orchestrating uh, really important projects uh, for this um, with so much community involvement. I felt that, you know, Wing Luke has such a unique way of doing things with their community process, right? Um, I think that was a really great introduction to me um, in just really understanding how you engage a community to support your work. What's on the exhibit floor, guiding that process, really uh, sharpening what the story is about, um, uh, as well as you create a movement around Asian Pacific American culture and history. Uh, uh, that people invest in. I mean, one of the things we used to say all the time is like, we, you know, we look as a movement more than a museum, right? It's, there may be people uh, there for other museums like them, like the Japanese American National Museum in uh, Los Angeles, uh, that those flagship organizations will have people who will join as members and make contributions, but never, may never walk through the door, right? So, uh, but they believe in the move, they're in for the movement, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, certainly in, in organizations just have, uh, you know, they, they have a, um, a more complexity to it, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a bigger organization to pay for. Fundraising becomes a major part of it. It has to, right? Because we don't, we don't operate at the, at our the charging people admission or tickets are, isn't the exact cost of, uh, of what it takes. Uh, you know, and I had this really interesting kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, two organizations right in a row uh, between Wing Luke and then I went over to uh, the city of Seattle, Seattle Parks and Recreation, who at the time uh, managed Langston Hughes Performing Arts Center before they changed their name um, uh, as a unique community center within their 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 um, their uh, family of 28 or 26 community centers. So that was really different. I mean, that was you know, I mean, that is a historic center for. Uh, a creative black brilliance, right? And uh, but it was but it was within the the massive bureaucracy of the city, you know, right. very different. Very that's a very yeah very complex kind of situation I imagine with between the city and the yeah that's interesting. But one thing that I really appreciated about it, I mean, there's a lot to there's a lot that could be said about uh, about that time. And Langston Hughes is, it operates now under the Office of Arts and Culture. But what I really appreciated is 
uh, for a theater, no better place to be uh, than um, Seattle Parks and Recreation. They believe in fun and play and, and you know, and creativity is inherent in that. Um, and then also to be, you know, uh, we were, when I first came on, we were in the recreation division. So it was Langston Hughes and it was all the golf courses and it was small craft recreation and it was sporting, uh, all the sports uh, uh, and senior programs and on and on and on. I mean, it was a really broad management group. And, uh, but I thought that it was really important because it ensured that theater and arts had and culture had a place at the table. That yeah. it was the same discussion for all the city of Seattle and all Seattleites. And, and in our role, it was uniquely through theater and performance. And, um, and then when you went to Youth Theater Northwest on Mercer Island, I mean, you've, you, had, you had been um, developing youth programs in other places as well, but then you sort of really shifted to a youth focus with that, with that theater in a, in a different neighborhood again. I mean, it's interesting to me that, I mean, Mercer Island is, I wouldn't say necessarily just as a neighborhood, but but you you were working for very local based organizations, and yeah. um, and then Youth Theater Northwest is a you know youth youth oriented. You were there for ten years, right? Ten years, you know, and I think one thing that's that um, I mean I love Youth Theater Northwest, and yeah. and and one of the big things that drew me there was not just uh, the community. You think about us as creative people; we're drawn to people. Right. Try families and the work, right? And um, uh, and I had some really dear friends working for YTN, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'd love with you guys, you know. And uh, um, and what a time it was! I mean, that is the longest I've ever spent at an organization because we had some really significant hurdles. I mean, um, uh, usually, like up until that point, the longest I'd been somewhere was Langston Hughes, and that was five years. Uh, but then, uh, right after I started, the recession hit. Oh my God! And that was a that was a slow roller coaster down, and then a slow climb back out. Yeah. And then I was feeling okay. Whew, we survived. I didn't think we would survive. Uh, and then YTM lost its building, you know, because it was being reclaimed because we were renting a mothball junior high school, and they wanted to build a new elementary school for a growing population of of of, of kids there. Um, and so then we had to transition and we had to build a temporary site and, and uh, start the plans for a, a new permanent space, uh, which they're still in pursuit of. And uh, so, yeah. Um, and, you know, but all through that, what am I doing? Uh, sure, I'm balancing the budget and I'm making yeah. decisions, but in the next room, kids are singing Hamilton or, you know, yeah, right. uh, the number of kids in little furry costumes and furry ears. I mean, you know, uh, trolls everywhere, <laughs> trolls. I mean, you know, uh, what a joyful place. Uh, um, and really, and, and but also taking the time before that, arts and education was always embedded in any, uh, arts education was always embedded in any organization I was with, but at YTN, it was the focus mission, you know, so that uh, really allowed me the time to really focus on the importance, you know, social, emotional learning, uh, the broad range uh, of skill sets that are developed through theater, you know, theater skills or life skills, and um, um, and also just honestly to work with some of the, the most lovely, fun people uh, to be with, so... Yeah. And all of these experiences, I, I imagine, were just, I mean, the variation of experiences and organizations that you work for or with um, really were good for your current position yes. as, at Inspire Washington, which is really so much about uniting arts organizations and culture and science organizations across the state. What is Inspire Washington, for those who don't know? Well, uh, Inspire Washington is opening doors to Washingtonians, to science, heritage, and the arts. Uh, we are the state's primary, uh, primary cultural advocacy organization. You know, we believe in the profound value of cultural work. Uh, what does that mean? That's a lot of like, you know, fluffy, aspirational kind of stuff. What it means is that we recognize that there's not enough resources to do all these important things uh, for theaters to survive. Uh, for museums to survive, uh, for the broad array of science organizations to survive. And, uh, and we also recognize that across Washington state, audiences don't have equal access to these great programs. Um, you know, it's, 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 
we have now, so, you know, I, I originally became the executive director for Cultural Access Washington, and then we merged with the Washington State Arts Alliance and then had a new vision for Inspire Washington. And uh, if I was to kind of like highlight one of the most important things about who we are and, and how it, and, and things that really define who we are is um, for Cultural Access Washington, the loss of the 2017 campaign for Access for All was a reckoning period, right? Mm -hmm. And um, looking at the number and look, talking to people who didn't support it and, and looking at the number of voters that didn't support it, even though a huge number did, what we really recognize is how important that proposition is, right? We'll talk about it as a voter proposition, right? We're gonna increase your taxes this much and you're gonna get this. Is that worth it to you? If so, vote yes, right? There's the voter proposition. But we're, but we're offering something even a little bit more intangible for them, a cultural proposition, right? It's like, we're going to make your life richer. We're going to expand the education of your child. We're going to make sure that people in your community have greater access to arts and culture and this, and we believe it will strengthen it in this or that way. And we just did not figure out how to articulate that well. Um, and also from some of our reckoning, when we really started trying to wrap our brains around, who are we here to serve? Um, we're here to serve communities. You know, of course we love Seattle Rep and we're thankful that you are our partner in providing these great programs to the communities you serve. And that's why we really went in the direction of our name, Inspire Washington. There is a very predictable, because we researched them all, um, formula to create a name for a cultural advocacy organization with name of date. Uh, it um, next the area of focus arts culture arts education and then there's like a, a short list of six or eight words uh, you know alliance league right we literally researched all the organizations and we decided to break that mold and make it very clear from uh, that we are here to serve communities we want every community across Washington to really experience uh, the magic and and the impact of what of how of, of cultural programming, all of it, art, science, heritage. It's not just also organizational work. It's also recognizing that um, that creative and cultural work doesn't necessarily only happen within a nonprofit organization. Like I like to say, do we really care if somebody works, if a creative person or a cultural person works for a nonprofit or works? Uh, for themselves or, uh, you know, in a commercial venture, we just care that creative people work. Um, so because of that, um, it's, uh, so we also serve, you know, artists, individual artists, potters on, on, in the San Juan Islands, music bands, right? Um, anything that's driven by curiosity, any work that's driven by curiosity, creativity, or critical thinking. That's what Inspire Washington is. That's what we believe in. And we do that through advocacy work, coalition building, um, education programs for the sector and field, um, uh, and, um, and resource development, trying to figure out what new resources, what laws should be passed, what new funding should be created to really serve the field. <clears throat> it's really, it's really exciting. And, you know, I think those of us who are in the arts know that, um, that the state of public funding for the arts in Washington state is pretty pretty abysmal, honestly. I mean, we're, we, we have a long way to go and Inspire Washington is doing so much to sort of raise a consciousness, connect groups together, um, make the case for arts funding, for, for public arts funding. Um, yes. why, is, why is the state of arts funding in our state so bad? Well, it all starts with um, it all starts with the investment first from the uh, from the federal government, yeah. right? So right now, Washington State ranks 45th in the nation for the state's investment in arts and creativity per capita, right? It doesn't encompass everything, but it's a really good it's a, it's a really good quick temperature check, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is and this is why we we rank that number because. Um, how do we even come up with money from the state to support arts and creativity? In the federal government, they appropriate money to the National Endowment for the Arts. There is a, there's, there is a, a formula that's baked into it that directs a certain portion of that money to state arts agencies in Washington, in Oregon, in California. And the state has at a minimum of $1 
dollar per dollar. Arts, we get about $825,000 uh, through the National Endowment for the Arts that goes to the Washington State Arts Commission and the state matches at about 2 million. So those two things, how much is the feds putting in and how much is our states putting in is what drives us to the lowest, one of the lowest numbers. Some years we're number 46. Right now, I think it's fair to say we're probably about 45. Um, so I think uh, there's there's also a lot of reasons for that. We have a, re why doesn't the state give more money? Well, there's, um, uh, we have a really regressive tax system. You know, they're struggling to pay for ferries, you know, um, uh, and all sorts of other things. So that's that's one of the problems is our structure is really limiting. And it doesn't just hurt us, it hurts all the things that we need and care about, such as mental health and uh, uh, highways and broadband access. And and again, again, let's get back to the ferry boats. I, I, there was one whole legislative session where they're trying to find money for one ferry boat. They're really expensive. <laughs> um, so, so it's so that's it's partly how much the state will invest, and they have a whole bunch of issues there. Um, but I will say, until COVID, the state was doing pretty good. So I'm not going to totally let them off the hook. They've got some money to throw around. Yeah. And it's also the federal government. My gosh, I mean, we have been. Uh, what's really crazy is last year, a hundred was the amount again. I think it was 167 last year congress appropriated 167 million dollars to the national endowment for the arts i may be a few a few million off um and that was the single greatest increase in a number of years we all felt really good about it because we worked to advocate for that but let me tell you that was still far short of the 177 million that congress appropriated in 1992. yeah Oh, gosh, we're back. We're back to 1992. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, gosh, wow. Think about all the, the music. Think about what we were wearing and the music we're listening. And they were giving more money, right? The culture wars, recessions, wars, a whole bunch of stuff just drove the federal investment down, right? Yeah. And it is really hard to bring it up. So what is the solution? Well, there's a number of different solutions. One, um, uh, more federal investment, which we could probably secure with advocacy, not just through Washington, but in every state in the nation, as well as a greater match from the state or, and, and some other big North star, another source of revenue. You know, uh, other states have pursued it. Minnesota's pursued it. They're, they are the most funded state uh, in, uh, in the nation because they have a unique tax structure that funds uh, cultural legacy, which is their way of saying arts, science, and heritage. Um, so I, I think that there's there's a solution there, but what will it require? Advocacy. Because I, I'd like to believe that the day will come, but it hasn't happened yet, where lawmakers will say, without us prodding them, we need to pay for more theaters. You know, we need to pay for more museums. We want to, you know, we want, you know, we want uh, all sorts, science centers in every region of the state. That hasn't happened yet. We have to we have to tell a story and convince them that it's important and show that their the communities care about that and want that for a variety of reasons to better educate their kids, to drive local economy, to create more jobs, right? Um, uh, all of those things. So I, I you know we're an advocacy organization, so our, our answer to everything is advocacy. We need to tell our story. We have a really we we have wonderful stories to tell. Uh, and eventually people will believe in us or get so tired of talking to so many of us that they're going to give what, they, what we want, <laughs> you know. You, is that, in your experience, is, is, has that been the most effective way to, to um, get lawmakers to listen to the need is to just all the individual stories of people's experiences and different organizations, how they make an impact in their individual communities. I mean, especially how do we, you know, how do we advocate in the time of COVID when there are so many needs, as you said, and of course, um, <laughs> the arts are, we're also in a, in a pretty, you know, in a desperate situation, I think in terms of, um, how we how we face this when we're we we don't have ticket revenue when we can't open our doors for a long period of time so we're all in this together trying to figure out a way through it but how do you what are you finding is effective in terms of making a case in this time when we can't 
tell those stories from our stages when our theaters are dark. Um, yeah, what are, what are you seeing out there? Well, what I have seen is that it does work and I'll, I'll give you a very concrete example with, that kind of branches off into a few other stories. In the lead up to the CARES Act, the, approved, mm -hmm. the CARES Act was approved on like March 27th or March 28th, right? In the lead up to the CARES Act for uh, one of the largest pieces, I think the largest piece of legislation ever that happened in a short period of time. This is the government working in a very different way than normal. There are a few pieces of legislation I've been working on for two years. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but in the lead up to the CARES Act, 29,212 emails went to members of Congress. Uh, every single member of Congress. Um, and what were they asking for? They were from the cultural sector. Uh, they were from audiences and fans talking about the importances of zoos and theaters and aquariums and choirs and orchestras and all the whole thing. And there were also some very specific asks, really calling out the signific significant loss of revenues from the forced closures, um, uh, pointing out um, uh, the, the losses and how we needed very specific targeted support also calling out the uniqueness of how we work, actors, right? Yeah. Independent creatives, right? And um, and uh, and we were part of that. And and we firmly believe that that made a difference. And the reason why is because the SBA, uh, those I know it was hard. The government wasn't set up to process all those applications, but but to our surprise and to our reward, the SBA made independent artists eligible for those. PPP loans, right? They didn't know how to process them. They didn't know how to talk to artists. They didn't know what kind of documentation they should ask for. Sure, that was a problem. I'm not making excuses for that, right? But for them to actually recognize gig economy, creative economy, creative industry, um, and, and also to make those sizable PPP loans available for cultural organizations was a huge step. They didn't give us the four billion that we were asking for specifically to the sector, but access to the PPP SBA loans has, as we all know, been the lifeline for this, this long, right? Uh -huh. And we think there could be more of that. So advocacy worked in that. And I'll tell you another story about that too. When we were sending out those emails through our action alert system, which if you don't know, please go check out inspirationleague.org. Uh, I got a phone call from the district uh, office, uh, the district officer of one of our state representatives. And uh, he called me up, I got the voicemail and he was like, I understand that the cultural sector is really concerned about, um, uh, it is really struggling under COVID and all the closures and our office is hearing from constituents and we really care and we wanna know the specific stories. And before I called him up, I, I went into our system because I wanted to see how many emails went through our system to this one lawmaker. Cause we're trying to measure what pulls a trigger, what gets the tension. And, um, uh, so what do you think, how many, how many emails do you think that was that got, that got this, the, the DC office to communicate to their local law office and say, say, call Manny and find out what's up. Uh, a thousand. 36. 36, 000, 36 emails. 36 emails. That's all it took. That's all it took. And I've now checked this with a lot of legislative aides and they'll back that up. I mean, everyone, every office usually has their own number. But this is what they told me. They have staff that is tallying emails and phone calls, you know, supportive of this, don't support that, supportive of this, right? And they're tallying them all up. And they know, and there's always a number that hits the hot list. And that hot list means that it has to come up in a staff meeting or it's brought to the attention of the lawmaker. And, and that number being low is because they know that the vast majority of constituents will not write or call. Right. They'll just grumble about it. They'll post on Facebook. They'll tweet their rage, right? So they know that there, you know, there's a number that's smaller than we can imagine that actually just resonates. And they go, lots of people care about this, right? And uh, so with that in mind, you know, it is our goal to grow the Inspiration League. There are 49 state legislative districts in the state of Washington for state issues, you know, all the Olympia stuff. And, the, and, and those uh, same districts then divide into 10 congressional districts for federal stuff. We're working towards the goal where we have enough advocates in each district where we feel confident that every time we pull a trigger, a minimum of 50, uh, 50 people call or, um, or send an email. 
it's such a small number, but it's it's so exciting to hear how powerful such a small number can be. And imagine if imagine if we had ten times that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd love to get two hundred every time yeah. I did. You know, yeah. we'll get everything we want. You know, exactly. <laughs> but exactly. um, but it just shows that it shows that lawmakers care about what constituents think. Of course they do. These people elected them, right? right. And of course they do. There's a, there's a tremendous the values that so many of these lawmakers have around. I mean, I know there's a lot of characters we see on TV, but um, on the in the news, I mean, but a lot of them really operate that they are. I mean, they're public servants, right? And and they and they're operating a, in on the behalf of their constituents. So getting in front of people, and they are really willing with time. Representative Denny Hack, he stepped off. I had a latest l- lately, I had a, a Zoom with him. He was on his phone. He had a mask on. He was in a corner of the state capitol. I mean, I'm sorry, the state capitol, the nation's capital. And he was like, tell me, I want to hear the stories. Yeah. Outreach, advocacy. Advocacy is just telling what we do, why it matters, how it's impacting our communities, and what we need to be able to do more. <clears throat> yeah, well, um, I encourage everybody out there to, to sign up. Um, I'll go to the Inspire Washington site. I'm sure we can put that link in the chat and sign up for those, <laughs> for those action alerts. And um I think last week in our intermission edition, this newsletter that we send out weekly, we talked about advocacy and um, what folks can do to to make a difference. And this is just, I think, great reinforcement, Manny, that we can all and we can all make a difference here. And we hear that, but but I think it's it's a good reminder of just how effective and powerful it can be. And of course, we we need to do it more more now than ever before. Um, oh my gosh. And especially in the next month, I'm telling right. you right now, like we work really hard. Um, I know that, I, I know that Congress is really disappointed right now. You know, yeah. they, they really failed us in not passing more COVID relief. Yeah. Um, but the things that we want um, are really um, our lawmakers for Washington state understand that a second round PPP loan for cultural organizations is vital, that extended federal enhanced unemployment is critical because our creative people will not be able to work like they did before. We need t-shirts, first to close, last to open, <laughs> you know, I yeah. mean, yeah. <laughs> we need, uh, so we need that that unemployment and, uh, um, and there's a, a number of other things that we need, but like, let's just start there, you know? I mean, that could really hold our cultural sector together until, um, it is safer for people to come out until there's an opening night at Seattle Rep again, or at the Merck Playhouse in uh, in the Metal Valley. Uh, we've got to hold our organizations together through that. So that that's that's why you need to sign up, and it's all going to happen in September. In September, because there was no COVID relief, that was kind of a vision for late July, early August. So now September will be a very busy month of uh, hopefully a new COVID relief package and a continuing resolution for to give the government the money just to operate through a pandemic. <laughs> so uh, so it's gonna be a lot of advocacy. We're gonna be sending out action alerts through the month of September. Good, well, we'll, we'll look for those and, um, and join you in the fight, Manny. Thank you for all that you do for all of us in the cultural sector and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to well, of course. spend with us tonight and tell us more about who you are and what you do. and. Um, it was fun to talk a little bit about history of theater in Seattle too. So thanks for, thanks for all that. Uh, and I, I want to thank all of you for spending uh, the evening with Manny and I, uh, me uh, um, coming together even virtually to talk about theater and um, share a, a conversation. Uh, if you're able, we invite you to consider making a gift to Seattle Rep so that we can continue to connect to our community and share our creativity and to continue to put theater at the heart of public life. That's what it's all about. So thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Good night.